Hello, everyone. So last time we talked about the concept of Brahma, the underlying source of all reality, the underlying ground of all being, that from which we all can come from. And the idea is that Brahman is beyond comprehension, beyond words. However, the three characteristics that were often most associated with Brahman were Sat, Chit, Ananda, ultimate aliveness, ultimate consciousness, awareness, ultimate bliss. When we ask the question, what is it that we want, really want, Hinduism tells us that underlying everything that we want is really liberation, is really freedom from limitations. In particular, what we want is freedom from the limitation of aliveness, freedom from any limitation on awareness, and freedom from any limitation on our happiness and joy, our bliss. What we really want is sat chit ananda. And in this sense, then, Hinduism can be seen in two lights, even though there's several. And we'll discuss two. There's the yoga school approach to Hinduism and the Advaita Vedanta approach to Hinduism. And they both describe why it is we want sat chit ananda, why are the ultimate pursuit of life for us is about experiencing freedom from these limitations. And they both have to do, though, with something, with some sort of connection or realization of connection with Brahman. The way to do this, the way to achieve Satchitananda, both of these different philosophies provide us with two different approaches, methods, techniques to achieve it. The yoga school is what we'll talk about today and for next time. And the Advaita Vedanta approach is what we'll discuss in the fourth lecture of the week. What I want you to think about as we discuss the yoga school today is why this might be an easier, well, I should say differently, why this might be a more popular approach, and why there might be so many more people to subscribe or practice this approach versus the Advaita Vedanta approach. So yoga, we, when, we, when we think of yoga, especially out here where we live in the West, we often associate it with various poses and going to a studio where we need to bring our mats. But at its root, at its core, yoga refers to yoke, to attach, to unite, to put together again, to bring together. And in the yoga school philosophy, there is this belief, or I should say there's a perspective on reality where they see reality as being dualistic, where reality is both material and spiritual. So two dimensions of reality. In our day-to-day -day life, it's very easy to get caught up in the material. We see tables, chairs, wall, and people, and we believe this is what reality is. In the yoga school, there's a belief that there's something more than that, that under, underlying all of this is a more spiritual, um, is an immaterial essence. And that is that from which everything arises from. So when we talk about liberation, the yoga school discusses liberation in terms of freeing ourselves from the limitations of the material so that we can reunite with the spiritual, so that we can um, uh, go back to that from which we originated. And it is by doing that that we can then experience Sat Chit Ananda. Or one way, another way to think about it is because our, we have this desire for Sat Chit Ananda in order to propel us into reuniting with Brahman. So the idea now is that Atman, our individual selves, are meant to reunite with, to reattach to Brahman. How do we do that? The yoga school is going to provide us four different approaches to reuniting with Brahman, and they're all based upon various personality types. Now, in modern psychology, we talk about personality types as ways of gauging oneself, finding out our preferences in life. And knowing this allows us to live life supposedly more effectively because we know how it is we best function in the world. Thousands of years ago, Hindu philosophers had a similar idea. Everybody is different. Everybody experiences the world, likes to live in the world differently. Some of us like to think about things. Some of us like to feel some of us like to do, actively participate. Some of us like to engage our senses. 
all of these are different ways of participating in the world, of living in the world. And the idea within Hindu philosophy is that all of us have our own personality type. So again, to emphasize, even though the idea of personality types is a modern phenomenon, a modern term, modern concept, thousands of years ago, before the invention of formal psychology, Hindu philosophers had this notion that everybody is not the same. People have different approaches to living in the world. As a result, then, there's going to be various approaches to reuniting with Brahma. There's the approach for those that are more emotionally inclined. So to reunite with Brahman emotionally, that's bhakti yoga. There are those who, um, who enjoy participating in the world through their actions, through their work. Uh, so this would be the approach of karma yoga. There are those of us who like to have a sense experience of this ultimate nature, or like to experience reality through our sensations. This is going to be the approach to the, for the raja uh, yoga path. And there are those of us who like to engage in the world intellectually, like to reflect and to, to think critically. The yana yoga approach uh, is meant to um, help those who have that sort of predisposition to their personality. So for today and next lecture, we'll discuss, actually for today, we'll discuss the first three approaches. And the next lecture, we'll discuss the yana yoga approach. So bhakti yoga. Bhakti yoga is the way to Brahman, the way to reuniting with God through love, through devotion. It's through an emotional experience. And uh, it has several followers, many, many followers. And it's usually practiced or expressed through the following. So anytime we see people devoting themselves to personal deities, it's a form of bhakti yoga. When people participate in rituals and festivals and become emotionally invested in these sorts of activities, this is a form of devotion, right? Bhakti yoga. When people go through grand pilgrimages and they give themselves to the experience, to the travel, this is a way of bhakti yoga. The belief or the, uh, the, the, the reverence for, for cows and for animals in general, that sort of emotional attachment to these things is, again, a devotion. And that's a, a form of bhakti yoga. As we go through our discussion of bhakti yoga, a question you might want to think about is why this approach, this particular yoga might be more popular than, say, yana yoga, that we'll talk about next time. So let's take a look at these various elements that we just discussed as ways of practicing bhakti yoga. Um, the first we'll take a look at is this devotion to deities, the worshiping of various deities. There are thousands, not hundreds of thousands, millions of deities within the, the uh, Hindu mythology. We'll only talk about a few. Uh, one of the more prominent is the Trimurti, which refers to the three gods of, of reality. Now we see lots of divine stories about the Trimurti within the work of Puranas. So we have Shiva. Shiva represents the aspect of reality that changes, that transforms. It's the aspect of reality that, that is in flux. So part of it, the natural nature of things is change, and that's represented by, by Shiva. Another aspect of reality is, is um, stability, right? Stability is represented by Vishnu. So the maintainer, the preserver. And then to create, to originate this aspect of reality or the, this aspect of the, of the nature of things is represented by Brahma, the creator God. So when we take a look at Vishnu and images of Vishnu, Vishnu is often seen in water and Vishnu is also seen in poses where they or he is not moving. So remember, Vishnu is the maintainer god, the god of stability, uh, pre, uh, uh, preserving things. So um, this is why it makes sense that Vishnu is often depicted as, as stationary, 
Uh, think about water. Why might water be represent, uh, a representation of stability? Think about what happens when you, let's say, push water or try to move water. Water seems to come back to an equilibrium. It seems to always come back to some sort of um, resting point. Right? When we think of Shiva, lots of the images of Shiva are going to be with Shiva moving, dancing, uh, with fire. The idea of fire is think about what fire does. Fire is a transformative element. It changes things from one thing to, uh, to another. So what we see then is a representation of the change of, of, of how nature works, of how reality works through dance and through fire, all of them representing constant motion, constant flux. Uh, Brahma is the least popular of the three uh, in the Trimurti, and Brahma sometimes is thought to be cursed. Um, there's not as much in terms of uh, popular worship as the other two. And in fact, even more popular than Brahma is a, another god that's not part of the Trimurti, Ganesh. Ganesh is said to be the son of Shiva and his consort Parvati. And the story goes as follows. Shiva one day doesn't recognize his own son and has his son's head chopped off. After realizing what had happened, he's horrified and vows to um, create destruction and to bring in turmoil unless a suitable head is found for his son. Well, the suitable head that was found was one of an elephant. Hence, the images of Ganesh are usually in human form for the most part, except for the elephant head. Now, you can imagine that if you're able to survive this sort of ordeal, having your head chopped off, um, that's a, a sign of being able to overcome great obstacles. So in this sense, Ganesh is often thought of as the god of overcoming obstacles. It's kind of hard to think of anything more difficult to overcome than having your head taken off your own body. As you mentioned in the past, the lots of uh, goddesses make up the Hindu pantheon of uh, gods. And the great goddess Devi is shown and uh, represented in lots of different forms. There's um, representations of the god Devi as a mother or as a protector or as a, a, a goddess of wealth. In the more violent and uh, powerful form of a slayer, Devi is represented in Kali or is manifested as Kali. And we've talked about Kali in the past when we looked at the Hindu thugs those that, that did those real ritualistic murders in order to give sacrifice to this goddess Kali. As you mentioned, there are there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of gods within Hindu mythology. So these are just a few samples. One question we might want to think about is why so many deities? Well, the idea that most people have of Hinduism is uh, of Hinduism being polytheistic. However, when we think of the underlying reality that Hindu philosophy uh, emphasizes, it's Brahman, this one underlying, singular, underlying ground of all existence. It's difficult to relate to this sort of phenomenon, this underlying ground of existence. How do we, how do we commune with that? It's much easier to commune with the face of it, right? And for something that's supposed to be infinite, boundless, beyond words, this sort of characteristic makes it hard for, for people to, to connect with. It's much easier to connect with entities that are more personable, hence the deities. So rather than think of all of these deities as being distinct and separate one way to approach these deities is to think of them as the various faces of Brahma, the various faces that allow us to relate to Brahma. Because otherwise, 
we will have a it will be a fruitless effort seemingly to relate to something that's beyond relatability, that's beyond comprehension. So how does this sort of approach help us achieve moksha? How does devoting oneself to a god, how does devoting oneself to a goddess, giving our love and devotion to these individuals, how does that help us achieve liberation? One way to think about this is to reflect upon a time in your life where you fell in love. A time in your life when you were completely devoted to something or someone. Do you remember what that experience was like? You may have experienced a loss of self. You may have experienced a, a, a sense that there was something more than you. And it's this transcendent experience. This experience of connection with something greater than oneself that maybe allows us to relate to bhakti yoga showing devotion and love to a deity or to one another through rituals and pilgrimages or to a cause this sort of devotion and love maybe we can imagine it gives us a sense of something transcendent where we lose ourselves in the experience of something greater or other. Now, why worship a deity versus Brahman itself? Hopefully this should be obvious that it's much easier to worship a deity that is um, that's seemingly person-like as opposed to something so esoteric as the underlying ground of all being. So much easier to relate if you're trying to relate to a deity versus Brahman itself. So when we see various rituals and celebrations and holy, um, holy days of worship, uh, holy celebrations, what we see is a devotion and expression of love for one another. And again, much easier to do that to relate to individuals and to people, to our family, to our friends, than it is to relate to this concept of, of that from which we all come. We, are, we have much more practice in relating to one another than we do to something as, as the infinite. When we give ourselves to a cause, when we throw ourselves completely emotionally into an activity, Maybe you can see how that might allow us to experience something greater than oneself. Showing love and devotion through acts like pilgrims, pilgrimages may bring out an expression or a feeling and an emotional uh, attachment to, um, to a, a pursuit or an activity that allows us to experience more than our limited small selves. Same thing with showing reverence through animals, to animals, or showing reverence in an altar. All of these are much easier for us than to simply try to express devotion to something that can't be seen and can't really be comprehended with words and language. So... In this sense, if you take a look at bhakti yoga in this way, can you see how you might have already practiced this? How you might have or currently do participate in activities or are in relationships where you give devotion, where you're completely devoted and express love. And by doing that, you have an experience of something more. You have an experience of something greater than your, your uh, individual finite self. The second approach, karma yoga, is the way to God through work by doing God's will, doing Brahman's will. And while bhakti yoga is a very popular approach, karma yoga may be the most common approach simply because we all have duties in our lives. We all do work in our lives. The idea of karma yoga is to perform your duty, to do your work, to do your activities 
with detachment to the outcome, where you're not clinging to the outcome of the activity. Instead, you do it because it is your duty. You perform the activity because it's your duty to perform it, and not because you're trying to strive for an outcome. One question we should tackle first, and there should be a parenthesis at the end of that sentence here, is how do I know what my dharma is? How are you supposed to know what your duty is? One approach Hinduism gives us for knowing our duty is to describe how as we go from stage to stage in our lives, we have different duties. In the beginning of our lives, when we're young, we might learn. So we become an apprentice to certain types of activities and, and, and occupations. Later on in our lives, we have the duty to be a householder, to work and raise and take care of our family and those that we love. Beyond that, as we get older, there is a sense that we move on to another stage where we now focus on more spiritual matters. And we help the community and we help, we help usher in the, um, uh, the new generation into the community. And within Hinduism, there is a sense that eventually what happens to us is the, the, the need to renounce ties to this sort of materialistic world in order to focus on our reunification with the spiritual. So what is your duty? Part of the answer might come from you realizing where you are in your life. What stage are you? So let's say you are at a stage where you're supposed to do work. Right? Let's say you realize now I'm in, a, I'm in my householder stage, the stage where I'm supposed to help take care and raise my family and those I love. Then the question becomes, well, what is it should you do to help raise your family? What sort of work should you engage in? And here, Hinduism again provides us with an answer. They will say, you do that which you were born to do. You do the occupation that you were born to do. And it is here we start to begin discussing this idea of the caste system, uh, which is based on the law of Manu, which we discussed earlier, and based on the concept of reincarnation. The idea being that when we die, we will be reborn again. And we will be reborn again into a certain place in society in order to help society best function. So some of us may be born into a priestly caste to become Brahmans. Some of us may be born into a, a warrior caste to be fighters. Some of us may be born into a merchant caste to be businessmen, to sell goods within the community. Some of us may be born to be laborers or musicians or dancers. But the idea being that within a healthy society, there are individuals within all of these roles and there's the right balance so that society can best function. You are placed into your caste by the law of karma, meaning based on how you lived your life previously, in your next life, you'll be born into a particular caste. We'll discuss more about the notion of karma and reincarnation towards lecture four this week. In modern times, what we see is a decay in this caste system where people want to express more freedom than to feel as if they're bound to certain occupations in life. So we can ask some of the same questions we asked of Bhakti Yoga then. How does karma yoga help achieve liberation? Well, let's think about this. Have you ever experienced doing an activity where you were so engaged in the activity that you weren't really, you weren't really worried about the outcome? You were just completely in it. Let's say you were um, playing a game or you were doing an activity at work and you just found yourself lost in it, so much so that you lost track of time even. The idea 
is that in that experience, you might have noticed that you lost, again, your sense of self and you you related to something greater than yourself. You related to this activity. And in that sense, maybe you can relate to the idea of moksha, liberation in order to reunite with something greater, Brahma. When we do work for work's sake, when we participate in the world for the sake of participating and not because we're trying to achieve some end goal, we are more likely to lose ourselves in the experience and then experience something greater than our finite selves. So doing something without attachment to outcome helps separate us from this thing we call the separate ego. One question I'd like you to think about for our next class or next lecture is what else could it mean to do your dharma besides doing that which is the most appropriate for your stage of life and doing that which best suits you occupationally for work? What else might it mean to do your duty? This is a question you should be thinking about when you do the readings from Bhagavad Gita. The third approach is Raja Yoga. This is the way to God through psychophysical mastery, reuniting through these meditative experiences. So when we think of meditation in uh, the yoga school, it is often seen as the royal path through reunification. Like a king that can maintain, maintain control over his kingdom, we can reunite with Brahman by controlling the kingdoms of our, of our individual selves, our minds, our bodies, and all of these that make up who we are. Sometimes they can run away from us. They can pull us in different directions. But by having control over ourselves, both our mind and our bodies, we can be more able to reunite with Brahman. So if we take a look at the self, Hindu philosophy can see the self as having various layers to it. There's obviously the physical self. There is the conscious mind part of ourselves, the part of ourselves that are, that are mentally aware. There is the unconscious part of ourselves. And there is something beneath that beneath the body, beyond the conscious mind, beyond our unconscious mind, is that which all things arise. The idea then is that through meditative practices, we can overcome the limitations of the first three layers in order to reunite with Brahma. So what do we mean by limitations? Well, if you've ever tried to sit still for any period of time, you might notice your body start to aggravate you. You might start to feel an itch or a pain or a tingle and soon some of those small sensations become impossible to ignore. And then your body's impulses and sensations can disrupt us and kind of take over. If you think about the conscious mind, have you ever noticed how your mind wanders and sometimes your mind can get fixated on ideas and thoughts and worries and frustrations. And you don't necessarily seem to have chosen to think about those things. Your conscious mind just went there. If you think about the unconscious mind, think about how past experience affects who we are. How traumas or, or horrific memories of our past influence our behaviors, influence our thoughts now, even though we're not aware of that influence. Within Raja Yoga, the notion is that if we can learn to, to control and deal effectively with these first three layers of self, master them, we can eventually start to reconnect with what's underneath it all, our truer self as that which comes from the ground of all being, Brahma. And it is through Raja Yoga where we see all these individuals perform these, these uh, incredible physical acts by overcoming these various limitations on the self. They're able to do uh, incredible physical feats like sit or lay on a bed of nails, walk on fire, 
etc. Now, these are some of the more glorified uh, examples from those who practice Raja Yoga. But the point isn't to show any supernatural skill. The point is to get beyond the limitations of the self, of the small self, in order to realize and reunite with the, the original source from which we arise. So get beyond physical limitations, get beyond concentrative limitations, get beyond emotional limitations in order to realize what's underneath all of those, that our true nature is that which comes from Brahman. So various forms of practicing Raja Yoga. There is Hatha Yoga, which is meant to uh, try to overcome the body's limitations through physical activities. And this is where we see, uh, this is where we get our common notion of yoga. Going to a studio, doing all these poses, isn't about exercise, isn't about flexibility. It's about overcoming um, limitations of self in order to get in contact with the limitless self. Mantra yoga is the approach to yoga by using psychological energy, or you can think of meditation. There's even tantric yoga, which refers to getting beyond the body's limitations by uh, learning to uh, become more adept at managing sexual energies, as opposed to having sexual energies dictate your, uh, what you do in your emotional states. The last form of yoga um, that we'll primarily discuss next class is the way to God or Brahman through knowledge. This is about reuniting with Brahman through reflection, through the intellect. It is here where we try to know Brahman by, by study, by critical reflection and thinking. And we're going to do this as a practice. So the reading for next lecture will be to go through a, um, uh, an element of one of the epics. So remember, there are two Hindu epics. We're going to go through the Mahabharata, and within the Mahabharata epic, there is the section that's referred to as the Bhagavad Gita. And you'll read an excerpt from the Bhagavad Gita where you learn about Arjun and his difficulties in entering into a battle that he's supposed to do. It's supposed to be his duty to enter the battle, but he has some reservations about doing that. So when you read through the section of the Bhagavad Gita, the idea is that going through the sort of study of the Bhagavad Gita, having some reflection on the material, is jnana yoga. It's trying to get a sense for reality by the intellect. So keep that in mind as you participate in uh, the readings for next time. As you may notice, as you start to do the readings, it may feel very difficult. What's this saying? What does this mean? Right? And this is why the Yana Yoga path may not be as easy as the, or may not be as popular as the Bhakti path. Um, but for many people, they consider the Yana Yoga path the quickest way to reunite with Brahma. So go ahead and take a look at the readings. And um, hopefully you get an experience for yourself to see why people say these sorts of things about Yana Yoga.